this is Ezra Yaron Noriega. Fundamentals of Dr. Kepi's Science 1. Everything that exists in itself is good, beautiful, and true. 2. Evil doesn't exist in itself, but is the denial, distortion, or destruction of goodness, truth, and beauty. The Origin of Illness by Dr. Norberto Kepi Part 1, Chapter 15, Page 55 Personal success depends on acceptance of the success of others. In order to succeed, one has to accept the success of others. In other words, just as the past must inevitably be a part of the present, and even the future must be incorporated in the present, Personal success depends entirely upon one's acceptance of other people's success. Everything we do is interrelated with the accomplishments of others. Therefore, if we admire individuals who are capable and talented, we will automatically emulate them, and in this way, do even more than they have done. But if we envy them, we deny and destroy what they accomplish, hold ourselves back, and keep ourselves from achieving success. Our happiness and well-being depend upon the happiness and well-being of others. When theologians say that one must be charitable to please God, they are referring in the psychological sense to an attitude that is fundamental for happiness. Personal good only comes as a result of the good others enjoy. This is Bill Madison, the ABC of Analytical Trilogy. Integral Psychoanalysis by Claudia Bernhardt Pacheco, Ph.D. Chapter 2, page 17. In short, a person cannot be treated in parts, yet to this day the physician treats only the physical body. The psychologist focuses only on a few problems related to social adjustment. The cleric deals with problems of a religious nature. And the psychiatrist treats fear, delirium, and hallucination with medication, electric shock, and institutionalization, and so on. Similarly, human society is fragmented into isolated parts which are frequently in conflict. A case in point is the incompatibility among the spheres of science, philosophy, theology, economics, and politics. This fragmentation reflects the schizophrenic state of the human being's inner self, projected onto social life, a fragmentation which divides everything, parents and children, men and women, employers and employees, the government and the people, the social classes. Born as unified beings, we must be treated as such. Thus the necessity for an integral science which is itself unified and which treats the human being and his life as a whole. Analytical trilogy is such a science. And unifying theology, philosophy, and science, which corresponds to feeling, thought, and action in the individual, it forms an all-inclusive whole that seeks the unification of all peoples, races, and nations. This is Sherry Lee Jester, reading the ABC of Analytical Trilogy Integral Psychoanalysis by Claudia Bernhard Pacheco, Ph.D. Excerpt from Chapter 5, page 33. The only true medicine is psychosomatic. The way in which medicine is practiced today is not authentic because it tends to deny the importance of psychological components, which are the principal cause of organic disturbances, while overrating organic factors. Even those physicians who claim to practice psychosomatic medicine commonly prescribe some type of tranquilizer which does nothing more than mask the symptoms and ultimately the real cause of the illness, which is psychosocial. Although the symptoms may be temporarily relieved, they return as soon as the medication is stopped. In addition, tranquilizers and psychotropic drugs not rarely cause serious and unpleasant side effects that are sometimes worse than their original symptoms. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, 
stated that sickness does not exist in itself, only the sick person exists. Clearly, although our psychological and physiological natures are inseparable, our psychological nature being superior predominates. The individual first sickens psychologically and then physically as a consequence. This is Francine Garcia. I will be reading from ABCs of Analytical Trilogy, Integral Psychoanalysis by Dr. Claudia Bernhard Pacheco, PhD. Excerpt from page 64, Conscientization and Inconscientization. Imagine, if you will, that you are in a dark house. It is disorderly and dirty. The pipes are leaky and broken objects are strewn about. But because you cannot see too clearly inside the house, you think everything is in order and there is no real cause for concern. However, if the house were gradually illuminated, you would begin to see that the situation was worse than it seemed at first and that a great deal of work would be needed to put it in order. Such is our psychological interior. Now imagine yourself in a theater watching a movie in which the projected image is cloudy and out of focus. You can see figures moving, a few colors, but nothing is clear. Much of the movie is lost. A technician is needed to put a stronger bulb in the projector and gradually adjust the focus until the image on the screen becomes clear. Such is analytical treatment. Consciousness is the bulb, the analyst, the technician. Analysis works like a light bulb inasmuch as it illuminates the contents of our consciousness so we can better perceive them. The analyst facilitates this process. If our vision were sharper, we would see everything more clearly. We would perceive all that is good, beautiful, and truthful, as well as the mistakes and problems in ourselves, in others, and in society itself. In integral psychoanalysis, the term consciousness has no religious or moral significance. It does not depend on social custom, nor does it connote simple knowledge. For Kepi, Consciousness is a phenomenon that lies somewhere between feeling and intellect. That is, it is founded on feeling that manifests itself in the intellect and it is dependent on the two to be effective. Thus, feeling and thought unite to form a third element, which is neither one nor the other, but a unification of the virtues of the two form a third and a singular act of power and realization. This is Vivian Martin with a reading of the ABC of Analytical Trilogy, Integral Psychoanalysis by Claudia Bernhard Pacheco, PhD. Excerpt from Chapter 13, Page 78, Action and Sanity. 2,000 years ago, Christ said, By the fruit shall you know the tree. Today, theological science says, By his acts shall you know the person. In ancient Greece, Aristotle defined God as pure act and man as a combination of action and potential. Thus, although he was a rationalist, Aristotle recognized that action was essential to the comprehension of reality. Modern physics has helped us considerably to understand how human essence is linked to action. It has shown us that the atoms that make up everything that exists, from gases to minerals, are constantly in motion. In fact, the equation E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times the speed of light, proves that the entire universe is based on action. The formation of a molecule occurs so rapidly in a trillionth of a second that only in 1987, with the help of lasers, were scientists at the California Institute of Technology able to witness this event for the first time. The healthiest individuals and societies use their energies to accomplish goodness, beauty, and truth, functioning somewhat like batteries that recharge themselves while in motion. People who are mentally and physically ill do not act and produce normally. Illness impedes the action of the human being and he becomes like a broken down machine, sometimes stopping altogether. Thus, the first symptom of serious neurosis is when a person stops working. This is Carol Dewey reading The ABC of Analytical Trilogy, Integral Psychoanalysis, by Claudia Bernhard Pacheco, Ph.D., 
Excerpt from chapter 14, page 83, Love. Love, as understood by Norberto Kepe, is the only true feeling, and it is extremely healthy in both the physical and psychological sense. Conversely, hatred, anger, and envy are not feelings in the true sense of the word, but rather attitudes that oppose the feeling of love. If a person wishes to progress in life and have greater consciousness of problems and their solutions, he must cultivate his affectionate feelings because it takes inner peace and tolerance to see our mistakes and the mistakes of others. Willingness on the part of a loving person to admit envy also brings him tranquility through the subsequent acceptance of that which is good, beautiful, and truthful in his life and in the lives of others. Only love is capable of tolerating the consciousness of evil in ourselves and in others, which is a paradox in that only the very affectionate individual will admit to giving little love, whereas the arrogant, hateful person thinks of himself as being full of affection. Love unfailingly brings progress and happiness, and this in turn automatically generates organic and psychological well-being. Love does not attack life. It preserves it. The ABC of Analytical Trilogy, Integral Psychoanalysis, by Claudia Bernhardt Pacheco, PhD, excerpt from Chapter 17, Envy, page 96. Envy. In these chapters, you may have noted that I frequently use the term envy. By envy, I mean the attitude of destroying what is good in one's own life and the life of others. Freud called this type of behavior the death instinct, thanatos, which he believed came from a natural unconscious. Freud noted, in fact, that in the most seriously ill mental patients, the psychotics, the pathological component of envy was highly pronounced. Melanie Klein, likewise a brilliant psychoanalyst, made a still deeper study of how envy operates in unhealthy psychological processes. Finally, Noberto Kepi contributed an even broader understanding of envy, having verified that it is indeed the root of all human difficulties in both the individual and society. The meaning of the word envy for Kepi is different from the meaning commonly given to this term. Envy, as its Latin origin indicates, invitere means not to see. Thus, by basing the true meaning of the word on its etymological origin, we conclude that an envious person is one who is unseeing, who does not want to see. What is it he is not willing to see? That which is good, beautiful, and genuine. Those things that are self-existent, since everything that exists in and of itself is good. Indeed, reality was originally all good, beautiful, and true before the human being began to spoil it out of envy. The goodness of another person, the goodness that is outside ourself, automatically makes us conscious of our evils by comparison. Our wish is to destroy this consciousness, just as an ugly person may wish to destroy the mirror that reflects his repulsiveness. The human being harbors a desire to be the only light in the universe, and this attitude leads him to destroy not only the beauty around him, but his own beauty as well. In Trilogy, we consider envy to be the basis of all psychological problems. That is, we believe that all psychopathic attitudes stem initially from envy and are directly linked to it. These destructive attitudes are theomania, the wish to be godlike, megalomania, having grandiose ideas, a component of theomania, narcissism, adoration of oneself, one's body, one's personality, arrogance, self-righteousness, a know-it-all attitude, alienation, a lack of awareness of reality, and an inversion of values the most serious of all. Thus, the envious person is the person who opposes, who says no, to what deep inside he appreciates the most, everything that is beautiful, all that is true. However, 
the individual denies what is good without clearly realizing it. He may in fact steer his entire life in the direction of unhappiness, guided by his unperceived and conscientized pathological attitude. This is Judy B. Reading from Liberation of the People, The Pathology of Power by Dr. Norberto R. Kepi. Pages 383, 321, paragraphs 2 through 4, and page 6. Inversion of Values and a Call to Action. Do you believe that people act the way they think? According to Dr. Norberto Kepi's book, Liberation of the People, The Pathology of Power on page 383, inversion is described as the process through which a person sees good in that which is evil and evil in that which is good. Problems at the social level stem from psychological problems at the individual level. Psychopathology is caused by erroneous attitudes and inverted values that everyone adopts to some degree. Such attitudes include selfishness, dishonesty, arrogance, envy, and intolerance. An inversion of values is manifested for example, when the individual feels that responsibility, work, accomplishment, and helpfulness are tedious, and that alienation, status, corruption, and exploitation of others may be of some benefit in life. Inversion leads the person to adopt an attitude of opposition toward reality work and progress at the same time in a subtle way he she makes an effort not to perceive this mistake we are calling you together to turn society around to disinvert it and head it in the right direction <laughs>